All right, all right, all right. All right. Let's continue the day. Let's continue the day with another pretty impressive talk. I can already feel it. How many of you are using Visual Studio Code? Real quick. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Um, Visual Studio Code for me personally is like my uh, North Star when it comes to performance and anything that is built as a web application, right? Like, forget for a second that's an Electron app, even if you just check out the Monaco editor underneath, like in a browser, that thing is truly impressive. Like, I use Visual Studio Code every day, and I'm, as an Electron developer myself, um, like, I don't want to say ashamed, but like, <laughs> god damn, that's so good. So, um, I'm very excited that Johannes is here, um, all the way from Europe, to talk to us about, you know, the first second of Visual Studio Code. I'm not going to say anything else. Just please give it away for Johannes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for all coming here. It's impressive to, to work on something that so many people like and use. Uh, today's topic is uh, VS Code, the first second. Uh, we're not seeing slides yet, but uh, I'll start talking yet. Uh, my name is Johannes. Uh, I like mountain biking and programming. I uh, work for Microsoft out of Zurich in Switzerland. And uh, my role is to uh, look out for performance. Uh, that doesn't mean that I do the performance. That means uh, I make performance uh, visible and I, uh, I seed the performance brain into uh, people's head. And um, so uh, just to put this in context, so uh, this is the, the startup. So you type code dot if you're cool. Uh, otherwise, you double click an icon and then an editor comes up. And, for us, the, the guiding and golden principle uh, was always uh, to get to a blinking cursor as fast as possible and to keep the cursor blinking, uh, which means like to keep the editor responsive uh, for the whole time. So that means no extension can, uh, can like steal CPU from you that you're never able to type and then, in the worst case, save, exit, and restart. Uh, so this is our guiding principle. Uh, this talk will be uh, the first second, so it will be about the startup of VS Code. Uh, that does not mean that we are not caring about uh, all the other seconds. Uh, we care equally, uh, maybe even more, about all the other seconds. Uh, so last year, for instance, uh, we spent a lot of time to completely rewrite how we internally uh, represent text in the editor, uh, such that you can open like very, very large files and uh, still everything works. Uh, currently, we are working on, uh, on replacing the tree widget. That would be this thing here on the side. Um, expect the blog post soon. Uh, we are like deep into like throwing everything out and bringing something new in. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, today's topic is uh, the, uh, the very first second. And uh, we want to emphasize this because um, startup performance is, uh, apart from the usual bragging rights uh, that you get with performance work, uh, startup performance is a thing that nobody can escape from. Right? Every single user of the application, from which we have millions, will experience the startup performance. So if that is not good, the first impression is already bad, and you don't want that. So, uh, this is why, why startup performance is important to us, and uh, uh, this is why I want to talk about it, because I think uh, it's, not, it's not very complicated. It's the sum of many little things. Uh, it's a lot of diligence that you need. Uh, and so I hope that uh, at the end of this talk, everybody can take something home uh, to improve startup performance of Electron apps. Uh, before I dive in, uh, a short trip down memory lane. Uh, VS Code did not start as VS Code. Um, uh, VS Code started as an experiment all the way back in uh, late 2011. And the mission was to do uh, developer tools that run inside a web browser that make you forget that you are inside a browser. Uh, so very early on, uh, so this is the uh, very first release that we did in October 2011. Uh, we had an editor, the, the clean editor. Uh, it could do uh, colorization and scroll uh, and word-based completions. And then we turned this into uh, something that we called the Monaco Workbench. Uh, it's already a little bit more similar um, to what you know today. So you have uh, files that you can browse, you can actually type in them, you can save them, and uh, you can read code. So we were actually using this one already to self-host, uh, like two or three months into the project. Uh, those two things on the left, what they have in common is that they were running inside a web browser. So we were not targeting Electron or like a client side, a desktop installable app. We were really targeting the web. And, uh, only later, like roughly four and a half years ago, we turned that into an Electron app. And in, in hindsight, this was very beneficial for performance uh, because we were always developing with the web mindset. Um, and it is slightly different because you're a lot more resource aware, you're trying to do things uh, more optimized maybe, you have a different approach to things uh, than, than building uh, a locally installed app. Like for instance, 
and a web app, you really count the HTTP request that we do because you go like, mm, there's like an overhead and it costs money. And in a locally app, you would never go like, how often do we go to the disk and how expensive is it, is it to go to the disk, right? Uh, but it turns out uh, that's something you should do. Um, what I don't want to talk about is, uh, is like absolute values. Um, there's no point in saying, oh, VS Code is very fast. There's no point in saying VS Code is very slow uh, because that's, uh, that's a lot of personal opinion. So if you come from Sublime, obviously VS Code is slower than Sublime. We're obviously faster than Eclipse. Uh, so these absolute measures, they are, they're very hard to, they're good to like talk at the bar over a beer, uh, but they are not, they're, they're very hard to put in numbers. Uh, what I do want to talk about, and I'm very happy that Francisca already mentioned this before, is uh, measure, 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 uh, measure and monitor, because you're not doing performance if you're not measuring, because uh, by default performance is invisible, right? It is, uh, it is not like if you have a programming error, the compiler might catch it, or the linter might say like, hey, this is invalid syntax, you're a bad programmer. Uh, if the compiler doesn't catch it, then the runtime will throw you an error. With a stack trace, it's like, hey, in this line, you are a bad programmer. Uh, like with runtime performance, this doesn't happen, right? It is a computer, it wants to compute things. So if you throw work at it, it will happily do it. Uh, so if you actually want to make your performance visible, you have to measure it and you have to monitor your measurements. And I want to show a little bit how we do this. Uh, this will be complicated because I see on that screen what I'm showing. So my mouse movements might be a little bit weird. Uh, so the first thing that you should use and totally get yourself familiar with is all these tools that ship with Electron. Um, they ship with a browser. That means they're very well documented. Um, the internet is full of docs and videos how to use these things. Um, get up your game, learn how to use them, and learn how to really analyze the performance of something. Especially the performance tab gives you a whole holistic image of everything that's happening from loading resources to executing JavaScript code to parsing HTML to rendering and relayouting. This is something you cannot escape if you want to work on performance. And I like to compare this uh, to a debugger um, because it is something that is tightly integrated with the runtime and that gives you very good insights about your application. Um, but then how you use it is also how you would use a debugger. Usually when you're working on a particular feature, you're doing this one thing and you want to see what is the performance characteristics, uh, but it is is not something that you would do like every day to measure the startup performance of your application because it's like a little bit maybe too much detail and a little bit too much work to get into it. Um, so what is the poor man's debugging, at least what is my poor man's debugging, is console log statements. And we actually have very, uh, something very similar for VS Code. Uh, we call these uh, perf marks. And you can see uh, our code is like uh, littered with these things where we just say, hey, perf.mark, and then we give it a name. It, like there's no rules how these names should be. We have a little bit of a will and did thing. Um, but in essence, what this does, it takes the string, uh, date.now result, and then puts it into a long array. And, uh, and then this data is just being collected over the uh, life of VS Code. Um, uh, and then, then you can use this data. So what we do here is uh, uh, we have this developer startup performance. So this view is basically driven um, by that data. Um, so all the like, nice tables and like, I don't know, copy, uh, copy paste friendly data for, for Excel is all here. And uh, this is good for you as a developer if you were like, hey, this startup was a little bit slower. And then like, if you're familiar with the product, you kind of know uh, where you should look for. Um, and this is something that we use a lot. But then it doesn't help much if this stays always on your computer because then you're always measuring your own computer. And if you really want to monitor performance, uh, you, have to, you have to do something more. So uh, it comes the, the scary word of telemetry comes, uh, comes onto the table. Uh, because like this data we are sending off to Microsoft and, uh, and then we are reasoning about it. It is less scary than it sounds. I want to show for once uh, that you can really see every single data piece that we send. Uh, so what you do is you set your log level uh, to trace. I've already done that. And then uh, you have a telemetry view here. And then you see every single telemetry event that we are sending out. And uh, you can see here uh, that for instance, uh, we did send uh, timers.elapse panel.restore was 26 milliseconds. So it took, uh, on startup, it took 26 milliseconds to restore this piece of the UI. And um, that data we then take and put it into a, uh, a data digestion system. And then we render fancy bars on it. And you can see that sometime around mid of October, uh, we actually had a pretty severe regression in the performance of this. Uh, it went from an average of about 15 milliseconds uh, to 300. Uh, so something was, uh, was not so good. And this is something we didn't immediately catch uh, while safe hosting because the output panel is not something we spend a lot of time in on our usual workflows. Uh, but then the graph could show us. Uh, the good thing is um, if you uh, 
uh, look here on the, uh, on the left, uh, we have a toggle if something is inside us or not inside us. Uh, so I don't know if everybody knows this. Uh, VS Code comes in two versions. Um, there is the, where is my dog? Uh, there's the blue version that most people might know. Uh, the blue version is the one that ships every month. That's what we call the stable version. And uh, then there's the green version. Uh, that's uh, the daily build. And that's, for instance, the version of VS Code that we use uh, internally as a team to self-host and also many other thousand people that help us uh, getting features out in a good way and helping us to discover bugs. So everyone here, I encourage you to use the green version of VS Code because uh, that's the biggest single thing you can do to help us and file bugs. Um, so with, uh, with that in mind, uh, we, have we have our reports uh, like this. So you can see in the insiders, uh, the green version, we had the, the performance regression. And if you go to stable, uh, you see the stable is always between uh, 25 and uh, 13 milliseconds. So uh, we could see this based on real data that there's a performance problem. Then you can drill in and uh, uh, then you can make a fix so that you're not shipping this to millions of people. Uh, but then uh, this, uh, this telemetry thing, or well, this thing is not something you would use for development because there's so much data, there's a little bit of a delay until all the data is digested. Uh, so you want something maybe, hey, I made a change yesterday, how's performance today? Uh, and for that, we uh, do have a little uh, performance canary. Uh, I need to bring it over to the other screen. Uh, so our performance canary is uh, this little computer. It doesn't look like a canary. It's my, uh, it's my very first ThinkPad that I got when I joined Microsoft seven years ago. And uh, it is slightly dusted, but we hand measured this that it can start VS Code in 1.8 seconds. And uh, so what it does, it sleeps, and then a few times a day it wakes up. It downloads latest insiders, so the green version of VS Code, and then it just starts up 10 times, and it tries to get under 1.8 millisecond, uh, 1.8 seconds uh, within these one time, uh, eight times, uh, 10 times. And if it doesn't, or if it does, it will tell us uh, sending a, a Slack message. Huh? It's good. We're in the Slack office, so you can see uh, we have the um, the Windows 10 canary, and it goes like. Uh, a best out of 10 starts, actually two seconds, so it gives us the hanky and says everything is slow, which is actually true. We're currently uh, pulling in some new changes, which did make uh, VS Code a little bit slower. Um, so now, now this is uh, a bad thing, uh, but the good thing is that we are aware of it, right? It, now we can make a conscious deci decision um, how, how to handle the situation, because otherwise you maybe wouldn't notice, because you come in the office in the morning and you work on a feature, like you're not every day have the 200 milliseconds bone activated to say, like, oh, 200 milliseconds, I can feel it, right? And then uh, this is like this guy's, you know, like then we have a discussion around it as the dev team, right? We go like, hey, look, the canary was complaining and it's actually complaining since, since a few days already. Uh, but this gives us the, uh, the way to talk about performance. It's like, hey, we have a regression. What do we do? Do we unroll the change? Uh, do we live with it? Do we communicate transparently? Hey, in the next release, we might not be as fast as usual, but we're working on it. Um, so the whole point is uh, you have to make the performance visible, and then you can make an informed decision because by default it is hidden. Uh, this brings me back to my slides. Um, yeah, so uh, measure, 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 uh, measure again, uh, measure against the baseline. Uh, so you measure against the baseline, and the baseline is not your competitor product, that's only for vanity. Uh, the baseline is yourself at a previous state, right? You, you measure how fast am I, you make a change, you measure again. If it's faster, it's a good change. If it's slower, it's a bad change. It's that simple. Uh, and you do that continuously because performance is nothing that you do on Mondays and not again during the whole month, right? Performance is something, performance is, uh, is the feature of every single feature in your product. So it's something that you continually do, right? And then obviously uh, you have to react because uh, measuring doesn't make anything fast. It just makes it, things visible. And uh, let's get a little bit more real uh, about uh, uh, measuring. So a typical Electron startup, um, this is uh, a proportion of VS Code. Uh, would, be, uh, would be like this. So there's some time getting ready. This is Electron waking up and starting a main process and then a render process. And then basically you have an empty window and then you can do stuff, right? Uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to load your code because your app cannot run without code, right? That's the whole point. Um, and then like we don't care much about Electron. There's like smart people working on Electron and Electron is always getting better and faster. Uh, V8 is always getting better and faster. So we focus on, on the bits on the right, loading code and getting to the app. And the reality of this is that you have a waterfall. Uh, so you're getting ready, uh, then you're loading code, and then you are running your app. So the waterfall means you're actually from here to all the way down there, you're not doing anything, you're just waiting, right? And so whenever have, you have a waterfall, which is very common in, uh, in the performance on the runtime behavior, 
uh, because it's very nice to do something, then you have a well-defined state, you do something else, you have a well-defined state. Um, if you cannot avoid a waterfall like this, you cannot avoid. You have to make sure the steps in the waterfall are as short as possible. So you have to make sure that code loading uh, is as fast as possible. And that is the, I said there's no single big thing, but actually fast code loading is the golden hammer of performance. Uh, there's a lot to gain by making sure your code loads as fast as possible. And um, that is the, the next slide. Um, so I, uh, I did bring a shirt. Uh, so VS Code itself is roughly composed out of 1,300 TypeScript files. And in the development version, we just load them one by one into the, into the renderer to like do build VS Code, right? Uh, so that means we are roughly spending one millisecond per file getting it into the, into the renderer, which honestly I think is pretty fast, right? From the disk into the VM, one millisecond per file is, is, not, is not bad, but overall it is, quite, it is quite slow. It's the biggest single chunk uh, of code loading. And then what you do, and this is like a, a web technique, and as I said earlier, we have like a web background. Um, this is like everybody does that, that develops web apps, you bundle your code. So instead of 1,000 files, you create a single file. Uh, and there is tools for it. So VS Code uses uh, AMD because we are a little bit older than the modern things. Uh, we have our own bundler, but uh, if you want to start today, you would use probably uh, Rollup.js or Webpack. Uh, so in essence, there's options for tools that take many files and then they generate a single file out of it. And by doing that, uh, you are almost shaving off uh, uh, 450 milliseconds, right? Uh, which is, well, it's actually not 450, it's roughly 400 milliseconds. So you configure a tool to put all files into one file and uh, then loading is already a lot faster. You see it's only roughly a second left, right? Uh, then the next step is you enable minification. Uh, so minification is the process of uh, ripping out comments, ripping out white space, and rewriting all those very nice variable names that you came up with, with very short names. That makes the code just a lot more compact. Uh, in, in the web world, this is typically done for like a faster load, like a faster fetch from the server, but it actually helps even on a locally machine. Like I measured this on this computer, it has an SSD and it's a fast machine, right? And it, it, you can see it's, uh, it helps to prove it uh, by more than 100 milliseconds, and it's literally just like a setting in, the, in some config file, you say minification true, and then you gain this much, right? So that's, I think, the lowest hanging piece of performance that you can get to uh, when you have bundling already enabled. Um, the last thing it might need a little bit more explanation is uh, V8, V8 cache data. That's something you have only because uh, you run locally, or it's something you can only control because you run locally. Uh, Chrome. Uh, did this for V8 and they use it internally for websites. If you are a Node app or an Electron app, you can control it. Uh, cache data is, is the thing. Francisca mentioned that earlier that, um, you know, like you always start with source code. Like there's no ahead of time compilation, there's always just in time compilation. And um, so the, your source code has like various steps of intermediate representation, from so syntax tree to like a like intermediate language to, to hot code. And you can ask V8 to just dump one of these intermediate states for you. They call it cache data. Uh, so you create a script uh, in the VM. Uh, then at a point you say like, hey, please create me cache data. You get a binary blob, like a giant chunk of data. You put it to disk. The next time you load the same script, you just pass along those cache data bits and everything is magically faster. And you can see we're using that and uh, from almost 900 milliseconds, we're down to like 520 milliseconds. And uh, that helps a lot with performance. Uh, there's a node module, it's called uh, V8 uh, Compiler Cache uh, that does everything for you. It hooks into the require call and just does this. Uh, you can also drive it manually. This is uh, what we have picked because we're still like in the AMD world. Uh, it's a very simple API on Node.js where you basically say create cache data and you, then you have it. And that is something that, uh, that Chrome as a browser does behind the scenes, but you as an Electron app, you can do that by yourself. And then uh, all in all, we managed to not load for 1.5 seconds, but for like 500 milliseconds, the, all the sources of VS Code, which is, uh, which is the single biggest saving you can do, right? Because otherwise it's more like you shave off 10 milliseconds here and 50 milliseconds there. Uh, then we're not done. There's a few things that are in italics. That means VS Code is not doing them, but you should do them. Uh, the one call, thing is called tree shaking. That's a modern thing. Uh, so imagine you're depending on a, uh, on a node module that brings uh, 42 functions, but you're only using uh, five of these functions. Uh, traditionally, you would ship all the other functions as well in your product. Uh, which just makes you ship more files, you have to load more files. Uh, tree shaking, you know, it shakes the tree, so basically it copies all functions over that you're actually truly using, 
or symbols that you're actually truly using, and the rest will be not in your bundle. So that means the bundle is a lot smaller, everything is faster. And then the other thing is uh, code splitting, that's the opposite of bundling. Uh, so, so you might figure out that after you have bundled everything, the file is actually rather large, and then you can split it up into maybe two files or five files. It depends a little bit on your feature. So for instance, let's say you have a feature that is really not needed for startup, uh, then you can put that into its own source file and only load that on demand. Uh, VS Code is actually not doing that anymore. We did that in the web times. Uh, then we weren't doing it very right. Uh, and then we got always overly excited a little bit and then we removed it and we're in the process of bringing it back. Um, so fast code loading is the golden hammer of performance. That's where you should spend most of the time. There's the biggest gain. Uh, but there's more. And like now we're in the phase, like once you're done with fast code loading, or once you're done with measuring and identifying the real big issues in your code, um, then you're getting off into a phase which requires diligence where you can shave off 10 milliseconds here, 20 milliseconds there. And that doesn't sound impressive. You don't get a lot of wows in the standup. But if you shave off 10 milliseconds 10 times, you have shaved off 100 milliseconds, and that is already a lot, right? Um, so that brings me uh, to uh, all the small things that we do. And um, I brought two pictures. Uh, There's like a before and an after picture, so it's good to have that to compare. Uh, so that is uh, um, screenshots from VS Code starting. This is an older version. Uh, there's a newer version. And it was roughly taken at the same time. And you can see um, on the left, there's no text yet. Uh, on the right, there's text, but not yet colors. But that's OK. And what's going on there, it's not that we made the editor faster or file loading faster. We just cleaned up things. Uh, and we call that life cycle phases. Uh, so we said the, the golden guiding principle is uh, you want to uh, get to a blinking cursor as fast as possible. And behind the scenes, there's many things going on in VS Code that you might be not even see on startups. So we have, we have a contribution mechanism, some internal API, where like, some random command might uh, register. Like the whole source control integration framework will register. And like, in this world, it was kind of like wild, wild west. We would all like, kick them off at the same time, and then they would do their things. right? And it's a little bit like a traffic jam. Then actually getting the text to render uh, would be delayed because it would be stuck behind some other operation that you're not perceiving because they happen in the background. Uh, so what we actually did, uh, uh, life cycle phases is actually a nice word for adding a waterfall. Uh, so I just said before, a waterfall is bad, but then sometimes a waterfall is good because you have a well-defined state. You say, I first want to make sure the explorer and the editor is initialized, and then I do the things that are not super, super important. Um, uh, like, for instance, uh, getting the git viewlet populated, because you might want to do that after the cursor is blinking. Uh, and uh, the code is very simple. I can, I can quickly show that. Uh, it's not so impressive. Uh, we have, uh, oops. We have a life cycle, and then we defined uh, something like, hey, we are starting. We are ready. We have been restored. Restored means the explorer is there, and the editor is, is there. And then we have something which eventually, which means that it will happen at one point in the future. And um, uh, there you can see if, uh, if you do a ref search on ready, uh, there's many, uh, very few people saying, I want to work on, red, on ready. Uh, there's many people saying, I want to do my stuff uh, when I'm restored. And, just by that, like we didn't make anything faster. We just reordered things in a smart way that everything appears to be faster. We, we assigned a priority. It's like when you go to a restaurant and you order, they're not starting with, uh, with dessert before they start preparing uh, the dessert. And they're not bringing you the bill before they have served you food. And they're not cleaning the kitchen before they start cooking. And you have to think about it in the same way. So if you define a life cycle with like concrete steps when, when what should happen, uh, you can make things appear faster because they run in the in the foreseen order. Um, then there's, a, there's another thing um, where it falls into the same category. You're making something faster by not making it faster, but by running it at a more favorable time. Uh, and uh, this is a, a new kit on the block. I'm sorry, the wrong tool. Um, and uh, this is idle callbacks. It's a new uh, experimental feature in, in web browsers. Uh, Chrome has it, uh, Firefox has it, so that means almost every web browser has it. Uh, that also means Electron has it. And the idea of a idle callback is uh, you can compare it to a set timeout callback or a request animation frame callback. Uh, so you're calling this function. It would return a handle, so you can say cancel idle callback. But the idea is um, the browser might predict that it has some slack time, and then it calls 
it calls your callback with a deadline. And the deadline might say, hey, I have 10 milliseconds remaining. If you want to do something, better do it now. And uh, that doesn't make anything faster, but it, it allows you to use the, like, the void when your application starts, because there's often like, the user's not actually using it yet. Um, and then you have like a 10 milliseconds to create something that you would otherwise either create on startup, which means startup is slower. And then like the current, the normal technique is you do everything at startup because that's just how it works, right? That's how you program. And then you go like, oh, we have a startup problem. And then you start doing things lazy. So you say like, oh, this one object which takes 20 milliseconds to instantiate, I, I make it lazy. So in the getter, I basically say new object. And um, then you made startup faster, but you made a guarantee that the first access will be slow. Right, because you're doing it only then. And you have many of these things, and you can use an idle callback to select, oh, I got some 20 milliseconds to spare, so we'll create this object. Um, so that's uh, something we uh, discovered this summer. Uh, there's a very cool blog post from uh, Philip Walton. He is an engineer on Chromium and working for Google, I believe. Uh, so he takes this thing to town, and he builds like idle values and idle queues. Uh, so you should really uh, read that blog post and get going. There's also a node module. Uh, it's called Idolize. Uh, where you can do these things. Uh, I think for me, this was like an eye opener that there's, a comp there's like one new trick in the bag uh, to spread our work more evenly instead of doing everything at once or on demand. Um, then um, the last thing I want to mention is perceived performance. Uh, so often people say that it's cheating. Uh, so perceived performance is the process of making something appear as fast, even though it's not fast, right? So you're not making it faster by actually reducing the time it takes, like code loading. You're not making something faster uh, by making it at a, running this at a more favorable time, like reduce the traffic jam. You're actually cheating. You're actually running extra cycles to make something appear as fast. And we do that in VS Code, I admit. And I think it's not cheating. I think it's just good UI. Uh, and I want to walk you through the sequence, what happens when you click on a tab. Um, and because we have some time, I can demo this live and semi-live. Uh, so um, I press here, if I find my cursor, hello. Oh, yeah, there you go. So uh, I want to press package.json, and I want to uh, get that text file to load, right? Uh, so what you cannot see, I uh, use my finger, and I press the touch. Uh, and you know there's, like, there's two things, right? There's, mouse, there's three things. There's mouse click. Uh, there's mouse down and there's mouse up, right? Uh, so if you are not a gamer uh, who can click like in five milliseconds, you are most likely like releasing the mouse button only like after 100 or 200 milliseconds, right? Uh, so what we do is like, trust me, I'm um, fingers down. Where's my mouse? Um, oh, it's lost. Uh, so I, oh, where? This is weird. All right, there. So I press and now I release, right? So what we do, we do all the things on mouse down instead of mouse up. That makes it feel a lot faster, right? Uh, we, we cannot do it in all places because sometimes with drag and drop, it's too complicated to get it right. Uh, but in this scenario, uh, we have gotten it right, and this is the uh, important scenario, and uh, uh, that's, that's how we do it. Uh, but there's actually a lot more happened that was not visible, uh, so I did bring a little video uh, that kind of shows uh, what we did. Um, so we had the state, so the right circle means I'm just uh, clicking down. And uh, no, I have a mouse, I can go through. So, okay, now. I have pressed. You can see uh, the tab already says, OK, I'm active. So you have the feeling, wow, this was so fast, right? But like the breadcrumbs is updated, but the content is it's still the old file, right? Nobody noticed, right? Uh, <laughs> like we're just completely cheating, right? Um, and we do that. So yeah, sure, we could wait for the file to load. And, uh, and you know, that is usually fast, because this is not a very big file. Uh, we could, for a very big file, we do that for a big, very big file, we would start showing a progress bar if you load like a gigabyte. But like for these small files, and most files are like in the range of, I don't know, small, um, we actually pretend, hey, it's there, right? And uh, only then, if I go here and, uh, only then we actually, actually come in, only then we do the file, right? Uh, now the problem was, this was actually super fast. Uh, we would also not load the colors. We would present you the file just in black and white. And then after that, we start to like, tokenize it and say, like, oh, this is a JSON string, and that needs this color, and a JSON value string needs that color. right? So we also do that lazy. Uh, that helps a lot uh, with just perceiving something as fast. Uh, and I think that's not cheating. I think this is just a, a very nice UI pattern uh, to give people. Um, it's a lot smoother. Because what would happen if we say, like we do on, on mouse up, so it feels already slower. 
then we're not doing anything because we still need to load and colorize the file. So it would stare into like an empty white hole, right? And that just makes it feel slow. Uh, so we're doing these little tricks and we do that with tokenization. We do that when you start up the editor uh, very early on. We just show you like this activity bar and the, um, uh, the status bar and like the, like the outline of the tool before we have loaded code. Uh, it's like a little bit like server-side rendering. Um, and we just make it appear as fast, uh, which I think is, uh, is a very good technique because you have to do some work and if you cannot make it faster, you can make it appear as faster. Uh, this brings me uh, almost to the end if I find back to PowerPoint in this jungle. Uh, yeah, so the past and future, uh, you have to make performance visible. It is not visible by default. Uh, performance is something uh, that happens all the time. Uh, whenever you do a, feed, uh, a feature, uh, you should have a, a checklist. Uh, is it accessible? Is it tested? Is it well documented? Is it fast? Whatever fast means. Is it like, did you consider performance, right? Uh, so it is something that never stops. It's just a constant theme. It's the feature of every single feature. Um, you can make things faster by actually making them faster, as we've seen with code loading. Uh, you can make things not faster, but appear faster by running them in the right order. So by giving, assigning some priority or like by avoiding a big traffic jam. Um, so that means like running things at the right time. It also might mean don't run it at all, right? For instance, I didn't talk about extensions, but extensions don't run in this process. We have a separate process. So there they can do whatever they want. You know, it's their kindergarten. They can do crazy things. They will not impact the blinking cursor, right? It's the golden rule of VS Code. Um, and then, yeah, repeat. Like, it's always the same thing, right? You always work on performance and uh, work on a feature, then check it's fast, right? Uh, or measure the performance and see if there's anything you can shave off. And uh, once the big things are out of the way, it is just a lot of diligence. There's like a lot of small things. Uh, you might shave off only like five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds here, but all these little things, they add up, right? It's the, it's the opposite of death by 1,000 paper cuts. So there's many, many little things that you can do, and you will figure them out by yourself because you measure, and then you can make things faster. And by reducing five milliseconds here, 10 there, you will be faster overall. And uh, I wish everybody happy coding, and I'm very thankful for you all guys being here and listening. And we do have time for questions. Do you want to just pick people and I will bring the microphone uh, yeah, over? You have, oh, it's a travel salesman problem, right? You have the microphone. Yeah, uh, yeah I picked the first one here because it's too close. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for that talk. So right at the beginning, you said uh, use the Chrome DevTools oh, and like really understand the Chrome DevTools when you're trying to do performance. But my question was, what about the main thread? Uh, what do you do for performance on the main thread? And then also, mm -hmm. with VS Code specifically, how do you decide what work should be done on the main thread versus render it? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, I had a very cool demo prepared, I will tweet it. You don't do anything in the main process. The main process is the holy process. It's equally holy as the renderer process. Uh, this is like often uh, not understood, but the, so for you as an Electron developer, the renderer is the process, is your UI process in like traditional desktop environment, right? So you're not doing anything heavy because you will freeze basically your UI, right? So you do things in a web worker on a separate process. Then from the operating system point of view, the main process is the UX process. So, you know, like this was the thing that Chrome invented because they say like every tab is a separate process because this is from the time then a single tab could crash your browser. So they were like, oh, we make a new process per, per tab. But to integrate with the OS, they use the main thread. So every single mouse move, every keyboard event, they all go through the main process and then they get sent via an IPC message to the renderer. So if you lock up the main process, everything is dead, right? Uh, so I have a very cool demo, which I had to cut out, but I can show it in private to people, uh, where I block the main process and then you're not even able to move the mouse anymore. Uh, so that's, um, that's the thing why VS Code has so many processes, right? Uh, we have the main process, which is most of the time idle. Uh, then we have the renderers, which are, is our US process. Then we have web workers for some background work, uh, like diffing and link detection. Uh, then we do have the extension host process in which we isolate all extension code. Uh, then we have a shared process that, for instance, does downloading and unzipping in, uh, updates, right? Because there would be a classy thing you do in the main process. It's like, oh, this affects every window. I do it there. But then, you, like, during unzipping, it would kill your app, basically, right? So you cannot do that. Um, for the first question, um, yes, the dev tools uh, and the main process. You can start the main process to, say, inspect break, and then you can connect uh, dev tools. Uh, and that's what we do. Uh, 
So like it just started with, I think, minus minus inspect break, and then you give it a port number, and then you can use uh, the Node.js dev tools and just connect to it, and then, then it's good. Uh, there was one more question there. Yeah. Have you ever run into uh, situations where you've optimized for speed so much that you actually have to slow things down? Uh, an example I think of is I have like some old machines at home. Uh, one's running system nine before OS 10, and people approach that system a little different. It's like more wow factor. So they weren't trying to hammer it, but if you go in with today's mindset and just you know do like window shade or open a menu really fast, like it goes too fast for you know uh, what people can actually perceive as a, a usable speed. Are you mean like making it slower to make it not as like flickery? Uh, not that I'm aware of, to be honest. Um, I know we have done a lot of things in the editor to make it like smooth but yet fast with like a lot of virtual rendering. Um, but we have not slowed down anything deliberately. Um, we have done a lot of optimizations sometimes and we have overdone it because we didn't measure properly enough uh, or we just you know, introduced bugs with it. Um, but I think in general you cannot you cannot be too fast, but you can be maybe, um, it can appear as like rough and not like smooth, right? And then you have to do maybe one of these like uh, perceived performance tricks, right? Uh, or like a little bit of an animation. Uh, I think, hmm, I don't want to be unfair, but he was raising his hand already before. Is there any special strategy or um, when, you, when you open a really large file, how do you like handle that without crashing the editor? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, so, yeah, um, there's many things we do. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, so first, uh, it's a very long file, so you load it not as a string, but as chunks of bytes, because uh, until recently, V8 could only open a string of a certain length, and then it would create, like a very long string, like I think two gigabytes or something, but then it would die, right? So you're not loading you just you use a stream, right? You say like, hey, give me a few bytes, give me more bytes, give me more bytes, because the internal representation of text is not a single tree; it's a binary tree which has individual chunks, right? And, um, and then you're relatively safe. Uh, and then obviously there's a limit um, of how big you can be, uh, but I think it's like at four gigabytes or something. It's more like it's heat bound uh, how much stuff you can actually keep in memory. Uh, but there's no such strategy that we load only the thing that is visible and then load while you scroll. We always load the full file and we render only the lines that you see. And basically when you scroll, uh, we take the line that is scrolled out of the viewport and then we put it at the end, right? And so there's only ever like, I don't know, 30 or 50 lines that we have downloads for. Yeah, yeah I was thinking about your uh, cannery a uh, little Lenovo uh, computer that sits uh -huh. on uh, the show. A little... Uh, that wakes up every, a few times a day, and then you measure. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you know that the app is on the disk already or not? Won't it affect the startup times, which you're trying to measure? Oh, yeah, the, the first time is always super slow, right? Um, the first time it's slow because it is like, it's not in any disk cache. Uh, we have no cache data. And then on subsequent runs, it, it gets faster. You can actually see uh, here in the channel, it's my mouse. Uh, you can see the first time is like five seconds, four seconds, and then it goes like two seconds, two seconds, two seconds. And actually, we started with the other approach. We would, like, we would start and start and start and start, and then we had like math and like, you know, we, like, we would try to even this out, and we would say like the threshold is like 100 milliseconds, and we would use a computer that's like super isolated and we could never get it to run something stable. So that's the reason why we turned it around to say like, hey, this is what the machine can do. It has like so many tries to deliver because we know the first try it might not happen. Oh yeah, it's like just doesn't happen. Yeah. Yep. One of the things I've found uh, in building this sort of factored out multi-process architecture is that there's a lot of surprising latency in going between the render process, web workers, main thread, and so on. Uh, I've also noticed in my debugging sessions that you use a JSON uh, interchange instead of passing around sort of Pojo objects through the transfer. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you measure and think about the latency there and whether you see a lot of cost in that JSON serialization, deserialization? It's a great question. Um, we actually have a tool. Um, 
measure extension host latency. And um, you run this, and so what this does, it sends a few pings to the extension host and back. So this actually means from the renderer process, across the wire, into the extension host, like into JavaScript and back. And that uh, is about half a millisecond. And then the, this is the raw data speed that you get. This is the, like, the implementation is not perfect. Uh, this is how much bytes you can actually send or megabytes. Uh, so we actually have, uh, have figured this is, uh, this is not a problem. Um, Obviously, it's not, it's not as fast as it could be, right? But we're also not talking about the problem of high-speed trading, right? There's still a text editor you're typing. Generally, a text editor is not a class of high-performance applications, right? So, uh, in a way. Yeah, well, obviously, we pay a lot of attention. But, you know, like, I talked to a guy who works for a bank and implements high-speed trading algorithms, and he was like, yeah, sure, we measure everything in nanoseconds. I'm like... It does not exist for us, right? We measure in milliseconds, and that's like, it's generally fast enough, right? And um, so what we have, um, we use though, uh, just uh, our own sockets. I know um, Electron and uh, Node, they come with um, their own IPC channels. And if you use your own sockets, uh, then you can gain a little bit. Um, and uh, that's where we, where we tweaked out a little bit of performance, and we have like, we obviously do use JSON, but we do some tricks. Uh, so if, if something is already a string, you know, you don't need to JSON stringify something, which is already a string. And so we have a tiny little bit of a protocol, uh, but not really much. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at any, uh, using something like gRPC? Do you, do you get protobufs and do you get faster? And then you actually also get client bytes. So you, you don't even actually have to rely on ATPI. Yeah. So, yeah. So question was uh, if we use something like protobufs or. Um, we have considered this, uh, but then we're like, yeah, this is like, see, like, for us, this is not really a problem. We never, you know, like, when you do IntelliSense, for instance, we send, like, these messages back and forth, right? And we have not yet found that the IPC is the bottleneck in this. Usually, it's the bottleneck is uh, the language brain actually computing these messages or us uh, sorting them or us, like, bringing them onto the screen. And the IPC is actually the smallest thing in there. I know it's a nice, geeky problem to work on, but it's actually, unfortunately, is not the biggest problem there, right? So it's a bit of a pity. <laughs> All right. I think that's, that's an excellent close. Johannes, thank you so much. You're welcome.